The Miracle of the Seventh-day Ox The Story of Nikolai Panchak A Seventh-day Adventist pastor in Russia Imprisoned in a Siberian prison camp for his faith In our last readings We learn that Nikolai continued for years To be imprisoned in this small, damp, dark dreary box where he could neither lie down nor sit up but Nikolai was determined to stand for his faith or in this case be confined to the box we continue our story in chapter 19 of the miracle of the seventh day ox a few weeks later Unusual guests showed up at the prison camp. Three military officers rode in on horses, and it was obvious by their appearance that one of them was a high-ranking colonel in the army, all the way from Nizhny Novgorod. It soon became clear that they were there to inspect the camp. The warden pulled out all the stops and made quite a show of things, not that he had anything remarkable to brag about at the prison camp. It was a standard camp, out in the middle of nowhere, on the Siberian steppes, housing some 300 prisoners, with no notorious or political criminals among them. But guests at the camp were rare, so giving these special visitors a tour was the biggest thing that had happened at the camp in years. They were shown the officers' quarters, the kitchen and mess hall, and the barracks. Nikolai could hear their conversation as the tour took them near the stables. What's in there? the colonel asked, pointing at the low-roofed shed where Nikolai's box was kept. The warden glanced through the open doorway of the stable. He had put Nikolai in the box just three days ago, but he had hoped to avoid having to explain the situation to the colonel. Oh, this is where we house the worst prisoners, he said nonchalantly. Severe punishment keeps the insubordinate ones under control. What types of punishment? Oh, various types, the warden squirmed. The officer stepped through the doorway and peered into the dim shadows of the stable. We keep them locked up in boxes like that one, the warden pointed at Nikolai's wooden crate in the corner. How many prisoners are locked up right now? The officer was painfully persistent, and Nikolai could sense the uneasiness in the warden's voice. Well, we only have one man in here right now. And he is in for what, specifically? For refusing to carry out his duties. The officer stepped closer to the wooden crate, but immediately stepped back as his nose caught a whiff of the foul stench coming from the crate. Phew! he exclaimed. How long have you been punishing him for this sort of insubordination? Hmm, the warden scratched his head. Only three days this time so far, but he's in for a ten-day stint. A ten-day stint? The colonel looked skeptical. And you say he won't work? How many times has he been insubordinate? Well, now he's been giving us trouble ever since he arrived in the camp. The warden's eyes darted back and forth between the box and the colonel. Every time we let him out, he disobeys again, so we just put him back in the box. The colonel looked at the box again. And you've tried this how many times? Hmm, I guess hmm, we've been doing it for pretty close to two years now. The colonel looked at the warden incredulously, his mouth dropping open in disbelief. Through the cracks in the crate, Nikolai watched the whole thing transpire. 
and with bated breath, he waited for the conversation to continue. It was becoming more and more apparent that the colonel did not approve of such crude forms of treatment, and it also appeared as though the warden was about to get reprimanded for it. Two years? Yes, sir. You've had this man locked up in this tiny box for 10 day stints repeatedly during the last two years? That must be some 40 or 50 times at least. The warden looked embarrassed. He paused and then finally replied, Well, yes, I'd say that's about right. Do you mean to tell me that you've been locking this man up in this crate for two years and it hasn't done any good? That even with this type of punishment, he's still being disobedient or insubordinate or whatever you want to call it? The colonel was getting more irritated by the minute. Did it ever occur to you, officer, that there may be a good reason this man isn't following your orders? I mean, two years and he still hasn't come around? The warden looked shocked and bewildered and aghast all in the same instant. Well, did you? And no, 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 sir. It, it didn't occur to me just like that. But now that you put it that way, it, it does sound pretty ridiculous. Ridiculous? The colonel almost shouted. I'll say it sounds ridiculous. Totally idiotic if you ask me. In fact, I'm beginning to question who the intelligent one is around here. Certainly not you. He continued to glare at the warden. I ought to have your commission revoked for running such an operation. This isn't discipline. It's just plain torture. We Russian officers may be tough and mean as wildcats, but we are not animals. The end of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of the Miracle of the Seventh Day Ox. The colonel abruptly turned back to the crate. Open the box. He ordered, his voice still livid with anger. Open the box at once. Yuri came forward and opened the lock that held the latch. He lifted the lid and reached into the box to help Nikolai stand to his feet. It had only been three days since Nikolai had been put into the box, but by now his legs were already like rubber. He tried to stand without wavering, but he couldn't. The strength was just not there. With so few days between the stints in the box, he had slowly lost the ability to recuperate quickly. And each time, his legs would atrophy just a little more. Here, lay him in this pile of straw over here, the colonel barked, and get him a drink of water. He waved his hand to ward off the flies and the stench that was permeating the shed. And bring a bucket of water so that he can clean himself up. The colonel turned to Nikolai and shook his head again. What's your name, young man? Panchuk, sir. Nikolai Panchuk. The officer continued looking kindly at Nikolai. Is it true that you won't work? No, it's not true. Nikolai swallowed some of the water from the cup Yuri handed him. I will work. I'll work harder than all the other prisoners if need be. I'll get up early and stay up late every night. But I can't dishonor God and work on his holy Sabbath day. The colonel raised his eyebrows. The seventh day of every week is God's subota, Nikolai continued, seeing the opportunity to witness once again about his beloved Sabbath. I was raised to keep it holy, and I can't violate my conscience, sir. On the seventh day of each week, I can't work, because it would be disobeying the commands of my God. 
Nikolai wanted to be respectful of the officer. But right now, he was lying in a pile of straw. It was hard to stand at attention or salute the colonel while lying prostrate on the stable floor. The nervousness showed on his face. At ease, prisoner, came the colonel's reassuring command as he stared down at Nikolai. What did you do for a living before you came to this camp? I was a pastor, sir. It's why I was sent here in the first place, because I wouldn't turn over a list of my church members to the KGB. Nikolai's voice wavered and then almost broke with emotion as he added, I could not, sir. It would have betrayed the confidence my members had placed in me as their spiritual leader. Nikolai felt strange. Why was he bearing his soul to this unknown army officer? He felt chagrined and relieved at the same time. He couldn't explain it, but somehow it seemed the right thing to do at this point. So you will work, but you won't work on Saturdays. Your sobota, as you call it. Yes, sir. I'll work hard before sunup and well after dark to make up for the time I miss on Saturdays. The colonel looked at the warden. Do you have a job like this? One that can be done on some days and not on others? A job that can be done in fewer days if this man works more hours each of the other days? The warden thought for a long moment. Well, there is the water that needs to be brought from the spring a kilometer away, he glanced at the colonel. We need barrels of water. And it usually takes a man and an ox seven days of hauling to bring enough water for the camp. Enough for drinking water, cooking, and any washing the men need to do. The warden looked at Nikolai, lying in the straw, and then at the colonel. I suppose we could give that a try. The man now doing it works from dawn to dusk and barely has time enough to bring the nine or ten barrels of water we need an average per day. If Panchuk wants to get up and work before dawn each day, and then work after dark, maybe he can manage to bring enough by Friday night. I doubt it, but we can give it a try. The warden had a cynical look in his eye, but he chose his words carefully in front of the colonel. The officer brightened. All right then, Panchuk, it's a deal. Let's see what you can do. Tomorrow is Tuesday. The warden says that if you can bring enough water by Friday night, you can have your day off. Five days of work in four. If you can do it, then Saturday is a free day. And then the colonel got a serious look in his eye as he looked straight at Nikolai. But if you can't keep up your end of the bargain, you're going to have to haul water on Saturdays too. Your sobota, as you call it. Are we clear on this? Absolutely. I'm curious, Pancha. The colonel searched Nikolai's face. Although it was filled with pain, it held the peace of heaven. You have been so stubborn in refusing to work on your sobota, he continued. What happens if Saturday comes and you still don't have enough water? We've got a deal, and yet somehow I get the feeling that you'd probably still choose to go into the box than work and violate your holy day. Nikolai thought about the question before answering the kindest Russian military officer he had ever met. He chose his words carefully because he wanted to honor the colonel's faith in him and the warden's willingness to give him a chance to prove himself. If I honor my God, 
He will honor me, sir. He knows I wish to worship him in prayer and quiet meditation on that day. So, I am placing my confidence in him, that he will give me the strength to complete the challenge. I will work half the night, if need be, just to complete my part of the bargain and to secure for myself the right to worship my God on that day. You know, I believe you will. The colonel nodded and smiled kindly. The man's generosity made Nikolai feel warm inside, and it gave him hope that everything would turn out for the best after all. It seemed that this was the break he had been hoping for, the chance he had been wanting for two years, a chance to show everyone the sovereignty of his God. Nikolai rested the remainder of the day, trying to limber up and get his knees to work again. By nightfall, he felt pretty good. However, as he lay on his bunk that night in the barracks, he thought about the distance to the spring. It had to be more than half a mile. That would be almost a mile and a half each round trip. Nikolai figured it would take maybe two and a half to three hours for each load of water. From what he had seen, the ox cart carried two barrels at a time. So that meant he needed to haul five loads a day to bring the quota of water per day. But he needed to haul enough water for Saturday's supply too. There was no question about it. Nikolai knew he was going to have to haul at least one or two extra loads a day to make it. While his mind was whirling, he took time to pray before dozing off. Lord, help me not to worry. Help me to have the energy I need to take on this amazing challenge. It is truly a challenge straight from the courts of heaven. The end of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of the Miracle of the Seventh Day Ox. Before dawn had even lit the eastern sky the next morning, Nikolai was out at the stables helping Oleg, the ox cart driver, hitch up old Maxim. Oleg would be working with Nikolai for the day to teach him the routine of hauling water from the spring. Nikolai knew that this was his chance to win Sabbath privileges and to be a powerful witness for God. For two years, he had been confined repeatedly in a box for 10 days at a time because he wouldn't work on the Sabbath. But he had remained true to his convictions and suffered everything the warden could throw at him. Now, God had provided Nikolai a way of escape from the torture box with his faith still intact. It was time for Nikolai to witness in a different sort of way. There was so much at stake. Would God help Nikolai to do what seemed to be an impossibility? Could Nikolai and Maxim haul seven days worth of water in just six days of work each week? And this week, the task was even more daunting. Five days worth of water in four. In Nikolai's mind, it would take a miracle. But that was, of course, what God was all about. It was what Nikolai's busy life as a pastor had been all about. It was what his interrogation episodes with the KGB had been about his eventual sentence at this prison camp, and his confinement in the box for refusing to work on the Sabbath day. And it was what his release and new assignment with Maxim were all about. Nikolai's life of sacrifice and service to God had been one miracle after another. 
and Nikolai doubted that the miracles would stop now. There was too much at stake. And so it was that Nikolai and Oleg set out for the spring across the treeless steps. It took them more than an hour to make the trek as they walked along laboriously behind the plodding ox. Can't we make this old ox hurry any faster? Nikolai complained as the ox cart lumbered slowly along past muskegs and around bogs. Oh, we'll get the water in all right. But old Maxim has never promised me that we'd do it before dark. Often, we come trudging in long after dark. You should know that. You were there in the shed to witness it lots of times. Nikolai stared at Oleg, a stunned look settling in on his face. If they couldn't manage the regular number of loads in a given day, how were they going to be able to get the extra barrels of water hauled to the camp? Oleg just shook his head. I guess you thought this was going to be an easy job, he snorted. Uh, no, not actually. But I was hoping we'd be able to get Maxim to move along a little faster. Oleg made a face and shook his head again. Look, I'm sorry that you had to stay cooped up in that box. And I'm glad the Colonel let you out. But this business of getting more barrels of water so you can have your day off is crazy. Old Maxim here knows nothing about any of that. All he knows is that when he wants to walk, he walks. And when he wants to walk slower, there's nothing you can do to hurry him up. Nikolai wanted to say something, but he didn't. I know what you're thinking, Oleg Kepton. You are thinking that since you're a preacher man, your God would work some kind of miracle. I'm right, aren't I? Oleg gave the ox a slap on his rock. You thought your God would reach down out of the sky above and tickle old Maxim's ear or something to make him move faster, didn't you? And then Maxim would run like nobody's business and have all the water for the week all to the camp in six days. Hey, maybe even in five. Oleg was still shaking his head. His reaction seemed logical enough. Should Nikolai have expected anything less? He had thought that the other prisoners might admire him for standing up for what he believed in. But maybe that wasn't the case at all. Maybe they had no respect for a man who wouldn't work, especially if he was asking for one day of work off in seven. All the men were working hard, and they were all being held at this prison camp against their will. But then too, like the warden, they didn't know a thing about Nikolai's God or the devotion he had for his maker. Nikolai had nothing more to say. So he walked the remainder of the distance in silence. What was the use? The first rays of sunshine were just beginning to peek over the horizon when they arrived at the spring. Nikolai helped Oleg dip wooden buckets into the pool of water at the spring and then pour them into the barrels waiting on the ox cart. It wasn't a hard task. But several times Nikolai sloshed water from the buckets on himself. The morning air was still chilly, and the cold water made Nikolai shiver. He realized that if he wanted to stay dry, he was going to have to learn how to put more water into the barrels and less on himself. Besides, if he were careless, it would take that much longer to fill the barrels. Oleg put the wooden lids on the two barrels and then nudged Maxim forward with his ox goad. Nikolai was glad to see that Oleg no longer used his leather prod to beat Maxim. He used the goad instead to guide the ox and send him signals as to what he wanted him to do. The trip back to the camp took even longer since the cart was loaded down with full barrels of water. 
Several times Nikolai tried to urge Maxim along faster, but always the old ox resisted his efforts. In fact, any attempts to hurry him along seemed to make him move slower. If Nikolai could have gotten into the harness to help Maxim pull the cart along faster, he thought he would gladly do it. As it was, he and Oleg were at the mercy of Maxim and his whims to move along at his own pace. In the end, Nikolai realized Oleg was right. There was nothing they could do but walk along patiently beside the cart. The end of chapter 21. Chapter 22 of the Miracle of the Seventh Day Ox. At the camp, they worked to unload the barrels from the cart, trying to avoid spilling any of the precious water. It was a simple routine, but Nikolai wanted to get on the road again. Unfortunately, as they began the process all over again, neither Maxim nor Oleg seemed in any hurry to move at a pace that suited Nikolai. By now, Nikolai was beginning to feel that he would rather work by himself than have Oleg along. In fact, he was sure of it. As the two of them filled the barrels for the second time and then turned old Maxim around for the trip back to the camp, Nikolai began to form a plan. Why tie up the time of two men doing a job that could be done by one? The job was turning out to be much easier than Nikolai had anticipated. Old Maxim was doing most of the work anyway. Nikolai waited to speak his mind until after they had unloaded the two barrels of water at the kitchen. I've been thinking, Nikolai ventured. It's a long way to the spring, and it seems a terrible waste of manpower to have us both walking all the way out there. You have taught me what I need to know, and now the rest is up to Maxim. Why don't you let me try a run by myself? If I have any trouble, I can let you know when I get back. Nikolai wiped the sweat from his forehead with his sleeve and ran his hand through his hair. Do you think that would work? Mm, you're probably right, Oleg admitted as he stared at the empty water barrels they had just loaded onto the cart. He stole a glance at Nikolai. You'll probably have no trouble. And so, Nikolai began his new job solo, and he put his energy into it. As soon as he was out of earshot, he began to do his best to get Maxim to increase his speed. But old Maxim didn't appreciate being hurried along. A few times Nikolai tried whipping him up a bit with the gold, but after a few hundred yards of this, old Maxim slowed his pace to almost a standstill. In the end, Nikolai realized once again the truth of what Oleg had said. Old Maxim just couldn't be made to run faster. He would walk when he wanted to, and he would stop when he wanted to. And short of beating the ox mercilessly, it wasn't going to change things any. They made several more trips out to the spring, but as the day wound down, so did Maxim's energy. Near the end, he was walking slower and slower. Now Nikolai was really frustrated, and if the whole thing hadn't been so pathetic, he might have laughed. To Nikolai, it was obvious that Maxim didn't care how many loads he could get in before dark. He was just an animal. But animal or not, in some ways it appeared that Maxim was just another one of the prisoners. He was being forced to work against his will, harnessed to a cart every morning and made to walk back and forth all day to the spring. That was the life of a prisoner in a prison camp, wasn't it? Work, work, work. Like machines, Nikolai and Maxim would spend each day working as though that was what they had been made to do. They might not like it, but they would do it anyway, because that was what everyone did out here on the wind-swept steps of Siberia. 
But all of that was just rhetoric. At the end of each day, Nikolai needed to have more than his quota of five loads of water in the camp. By the end of the week, he needed ten extra barrels of water, or he was going to have to go through more pain and alienation in the box. This was his one chance. This was the opportunity Nikolai had been longing for during the two long years he had been cooped up in the wooden crate. So whether Maxim felt like moving fast or not, they needed to get that extra water in by Friday evening. If they had to haul water half the night, they were going to do it. Nikolai was going to prove to the warden that working hard and having a Sabbath day's rest was possible. He wanted Yuri to know it, and Oleg, and any other person in the camp who witnessed his persistent loyalty to the Sabbath and his God. But by the time the shadows were long on the Siberian landscape, Nikolai knew it wasn't enough. He was going to have to work after dark. The sun was low in the sky as the fifth cartload rumbled into the camp and he knew he needed at least one more load tonight if he was going to make a dent in the 10 extra barrels he needed by Friday night. When Nikolai had finished unloading the barrels, he turned the cart around quickly and headed out of the camp for one more trip to the spring. But Maxim had other ideas. He pulled the cart off the road and toward the stables just 40 or 50 yards away. Not to be outdone, Nikolai pulled hard to the left to steer Maxim back onto the road. It was a battle of man against beast, brain against brute. Maxim wasn't accustomed to going back out to the spring this time of night, but Nikolai knew they had to have that extra load of water. Nikolai used the goad to persuade Maxim can't you get it into your thick skull that I'm doing this for your own good? Nikolai half shouted. I'm just as tired as you are, he added with a stubborn resolution that surprised even himself. But it doesn't matter. We're going to do this whether you like it or not. Nikolai felt bad yelling at Maxim like that. The old ox was tired. He had worked all day pulling that cart back and forth from the spring. They had already hauled five loads of water and walked what Nikolai figured was more than seven miles. And now they are going to walk another mile and a half and put in another two to three hours of work. He wished he could somehow convey the idea to Maxim that a day of rest for the man on Sabbath would be a day of rest for the ox. But he guessed that he would have to leave that job up to God. Only the Creator knew how to do that. The end of chapter 22 of the miracle of the seventh day.